بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلاما على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد Today inshallah we are starting with hadith number 32 عن ابي سعيد سعد بن مالك بن سنان الخدري رضي الله تعالى عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا ضرر ولا ضرار حديث حسن رواه ابن ماجه والدار قطني وغيرهما مسندا ورواه مالك في الموطا عن عمر بن يحيى عن أبيه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مرسلا فأسقط أبا سعيد وله طرق يقوي بعضها بعضا the hadith is narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, radiyallahu anhu, that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, There should be neither harming nor reciprocating harm. This is a Hassan hadith related by Ibn Majah and al dar Qutni and others as a Musnad hadith. It was also re- related by Imam Malik, rahmatullahi alayhi, in his Muatta as a Mursal, in the form of being a Mursal narration, from Amr ibn Yahya, from his father, from the Prophet of Allah, while leaving out Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anh in the chain. And it has other chains of narrators um, that strengthen one another. So, as we read the hadith, before we go into the text itself, right off the bat, you see Imam Nabawi rahmatullahi alayhi engages in some discussion regarding the authenticity of this hadith. And that's what the last part of the uh, translation was about. It's a Hassan narration, who's narrating it, and we'll come to that um, shortly. However, firstly, I wanted to start off today's class as usual by discussing briefly the narrator of this hadith. The Sahabi who narrates this hadith, his name is Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala an. Imam Shamsuddin al-Dhahabi, when introducing him, he used the following words. He said, Al-Imam al-Mujahid, Mufti al Madina." That he was the Imam, the great soldier and warrior, and the great Mufti of Medina Munawwara. Sa'ad ibn Malik bin Sinan bin Tha'laba bin Ubaid bin Abjar bin Auf bin Harith bin Khazraj. So then he gives his lineage. There are two things to point out in his lineage. The first thing he says, bin Khazraj, which means that um, Abu Sa'id al Khudir was a Khazraji companion. Aus and Khazraj were the two great tribes in Medina Munawwara. Many of the companions were from Aus, and a large number of them were from Khazraj. And Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anh was a Khazraji companion. He was from Medina, not from Mecca. Um, the second thing, wa ismu al-abjari Khudra, because he's commonly known as Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. So there's a question: Where does he get this name from? Where is al-Khudri coming from? Abu Sa'id, we understand. But where is Al-Khudri coming from? So then the scholars, they explain by saying that in his lineage, his name was Sa'ad bin Malik bin Sinan bin Thalaba bin Ubaid bin Abjar. Al-Abjar. And the scholars regarding this person, Al-Abjar, they say, وَإِسْمُ الْأَبْجَرِ خُدْرَةُ That this Abjar, his name was Khudra. And when making reference to him, Khudra will become Khudri, right? So when you make, this is called Ya Nisbah. So when you make Nisbah, when you make reference to something, an American becomes Amriki. Someone from Saudi would be called Saudi. So Khudri, while making reference to one of his forefathers, Al-Abjar, whose name was Khudra. Waqila, bal Khudratu hiya ummul Abjar. Some scholars, they say, it wasn't Abjar that was Khudra, rather it was his mother whose name was Khudra. And making reference to that lineage again, he is called Al-Khudri. This Sahabi, as mentioned, was from Medina Munawwara, born in Medina Munawwara, 10 years prior to the migration of the Prophet ﷺ. He had a brother who he shared the same mother with. His brother's name was Qatada ibn Nu'man al-Dhafari. Qatada bin Nu'man al-Dhafari. He was a brother of his that they shared mother with. This Sahabi, Qatada bin Nu'man, 
is considered as one of the companions who participated in the Battle of Badr. So you see from his family members, there were those who were very close to the Prophet ﷺ, and they put their life on the line in some of the greatest battles alongside the Prophet ﷺ. His mother's name was Unaysa bint Abi Haditha. Unaysa bint Abi Haditha. Min Bani Adi ibn Najjar. And she was from the people of Adi ibn Najjar. How we know that this Sahabi was born 10 years prior to migration is because of a very famous narration. The son of Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu anhu, whose name was Abdul Rahman, he narrates from his father Abu Sa'id, he says, Uridtu yawma uhudin ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ana ibn thalathata ashara. That I was presented to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of Uhud when the soldiers were being lined up and people were enlisting themselves as warriors in this battle, my father also presented me as a warrior. And at the time he says regarding his age that he was 13 years old. And the battle of Uhud took place in the third year after Hijrah, therefore he was born 10 years prior to Hijrah. So he says, فَجَعَلَ أَبِي يَأْخُذُ بِيَدِي وَيَقُولُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ عَبْلُ الْعِظَامِ He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, he said, my father took me by the hand to the Prophet of Allah and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, take him. Now in one narration, he actually says that I was a shorty. So when the Prophet wasallam saw me being so short and saw my young age, it wasn't the habit of the Prophet wasallam to send kids into the battlefield. He would actually reject them even if they wanted to go. So my father said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, don't turn him away. Even though he may be short in height, he's very strong, he's big boned. He's someone that'll he'll he'll stand well in the battlefield. وَجَعَلَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يُسَعِدُ فِيَ النَّظَرَ وَيُسَوِّبُهُ He says the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم gave me that deep look. He looked me up and down. ثُمَّ قَالَ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, رُدَّهُ Turn him back home. فَرَدَّنِي I was turned away from the battle of Uhud, and I lost the honor of participating in this great battle. The first battle that he participated in. Um, some scholars, they say it was Khandaq, others say it was Banu Mustalaq. We do know that he participated in Khandaq, the battle of the trenches, because he himself says that he was one of the companions who participated in the battle of Khandaq. He was a companion who had great rank amongst the other Sahaba. A very knowledgeable person. Young in age, but very knowledgeable. Everyone knew about Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu. He is one of the Sahaba who narrates abundantly from the Mukathirun. He narrates over 1,000 narrations. 1,170 narrations are attributed to Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu ta'ala an. There's a famous uh, incident that one time Abu Musa al Ash'ari radiallahu an came to meet Umar radiallahu an during Umar radiallahu an's khilafah. He sought permission, Umar radiallahu anhu was occupied, so he didn't respond. Abu Musa radiallahu anhu sought permission a second time. Umar radiallahu anhu was busy, he didn't respond. He sought permission a third time, Umar radiallahu anhu again didn't respond because he was occupied. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari left the gathering and headed back home. After some time, Umar radiallahu anhu, he remembered that, oh, Abu Musa was seeking permission. So he asked someone that, is Abu Musa still waiting outside for me? They went outside and they checked and Abu Musa wasn't there. So Umar radiallahu an summoned Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu an. When Abu Musa came to Umar radiallahu an, Umar radiallahu an asked him, You came, you sought permission, I didn't say go, why did you leave? You should have waited for me. You know that as a Khalifa I have so many responsibilities, you should have waited for me. So Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu an said that I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying, Seek permission three times, and if you are not granted permission, then head back. Umar radiallahu an said to him, Prove this hadith to me, otherwise I will make an example out of you. Now Abu Musa al-Ashari radiallahu an, he was caught, he was in a tough situation. Not that he was attributing a lie to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he had to find proof, and who, how was he going to remember who was there, who wasn't there when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made this statement? So Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu an came into the masjid. The sahaba, they saw him and they all started laughing at him. They said, something happened to this guy. He looks like he's in trouble. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. One of the companions asked him, what happened? 
So he said, well, I just had an encounter with Umar radiallahu an, and I told him, I narrated this hadith with him, and Umar radiallahu an said, I have to provide proof, otherwise I'll be in trouble. So they all giggled, giggled and laughed a little. And then they said to him, don't worry, there's nothing to be concerned about. Not only will we send someone who has heard this hadith, we will send the youngest companion amongst us who has heard this hadith. To prove to Umar radiallahu an, that even the kids in Medina Munawwara know this hadith. And they sent Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an. And Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an, who was young at the time, he came as a witness in front of Umar radiallahu an, and he um, gave testimony to hearing this hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Which is very beautiful. This narration, the scholars usually quote it and reference it when talking about the authenticity and integrity of the chain of hadith. Muslims were always very particular about preserving their narrations. Right from the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught the Sahaba that they had to preserve the Qur'an. This was taught to them by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Sahaba took the, took the responsibility of preserving the Qur'an very seriously. And then they carried that responsibility over to the hadith as well. Umar radiallahu an, without doubt, um, didn't question Abu Musa al-Ashari radiallahu an for being a liar. Rather, he was trying to set an example that we will question the senior companions and also the junior companions. If you make an attribution to the Prophet ﷺ, <coughs> be sure that you can support it and make it properly. Integrity within the science of hadith. So this Abu Musa al-Ashari radiallahu an was a great scholar amongst the Sahaba. Hamdallah bin Abi Sufyan, he narrates from his teachers, أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَكُنْ أَحَدٌ مِنْ أَحَدَاتِ أَصْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أَعْلَمَ مِنْ أَبِي سَعِيدٍ الْخُدِي رضي الله عنه He says that, he narrates from his teachers, that there wasn't a person from the young companions of the Prophet ﷺ who was as knowledgeable as Abu Sa'id al-Khudri رضي الله تعالى عنه Some scholars have listed his name amongst the Ashabu Sufa, that he for a period was one of the companions who spent his day and night in the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, outside the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, just next to the Prophet of Allah, learning from him, absorbing more and more, benefiting from that companionship on a very premium, pure level, with him day, with him during the night as well. And the tabi'un and those who followed, they had a lot of respect for him, until the point that people who were not, you know, too friendly to him, they knew that he had a maqam, that he had a position. And that position had to be honored because of how knowledgeable he was and his closeness to the Prophet ﷺ. There was an incident that took place in Medina Munawwara in the 63rd year after Hijrah. It's called Yawmul Harrah, or also known as Harbul Harrah, the Battle of Harra. The reason why this is called the Battle of Harrah because this was a battle fought in a place called Al Harra on the 26th of Dhul Hijjah. 63 after Hijri. Harra is in the northeast corner of Medina Munawwara. This was a battle fought by the Sahaba of Medina, the companions who lived in Medina, under the banner of Abdullah bin Zubayr, against the armies of Yazid bin Muawiyah, who was the Umayyad Khalifa of the time. And a little backdrop to why this battle even occurred. There were a few, few things. The first thing was, Yazid bin Muawiyah. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu was a companion. Yazid bin Muawiyah was the first person to have governorship over the ummah and was not a sahabi. Therefore, his integrity could be questioned. The sahaba were the sahaba. They had companionship from the Prophet sallallahu No sahabi ever questioned the integrity of another companion. However, what they did do was they sent a delegation from Medina Munawwara to Sham. And they said, we want you to go and examine this person. Who is this Yazid bin Muawiyah? What kind of person is he? What kind of personality does he have? So when these Sahaba arrived in Medina Munawwara, and the people from Medina, the delegation, when they arrived from Medina to Sham, they sat with him, he took care of them, he gave them a lot of gifts, he, you know, gave them nice comfort seating, and you know, gave them the, 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 the top treatment. When they came back from his company, they came back and told the people of Medina, this person is not a good person. He wastes the money of the ummah, 
He lives in lavish palaces. He consumes alcohol. He womanizes. He's involved in gambling. We saw all of this with our eyes. And this is the type of person that you've given bay'ah to. So the people of Medina Munawwara unanimously agreed that they would no longer be under his rule. That was one thing. The second thing that caused the battle of Hara was, that, was the incident of Karbala. Hussein radiallahu an had been martyred by the armies of Yazid bin Muawiyah. And the people of Medina were hurt by this just as the entire ummah was hurt. The beloved family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was slaughtered in Karbala. So the people of Medina now, they became very upset. Abdullah bin Zubayr in Mecca had openly renounced the Khilafah and the bay'ah of Yazid bin Muawiyah. And people started giving bay'ah to Abdullah bin Zubayr, who was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ, who was the grandson of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. So the people started coming to him and giving bay'ah. The people of Medina also aligned themselves with him. They said, we align ourselves with Abdullah bin Zubayr. All the Umayyad governors and all their people who were in post in Medina, they gathered them all together and kicked them out. Some narrations say they locked him into one home, and they said, you guys stay here, you're no longer in charge. And another narration says that they just ousted them all from Medina Munawwara. When they did this, uh, Muawiyah, Yazid bin Muawiyah, he sent an army of 10,000 fighters, 10,000 soldiers from Sham towards Medina. And the general of this army was a person by the name of Musla, sorry, Muslim bin Uqba al-Marri. One of the soldiers in this army was a man by the name of Hajjaj bin Yusuf. He was a young man at this time. Later on, he would play a very powerful and pivotal role in the Umayyad Khalifa, Khilafa. But at this point, he's still young, he's still in his development, and he comes as a soldier in this battle, and the battle takes place. Abu Sa'id al-Khudi radiallahu anhu was one of the companions who was in Medina Munawwara during this period. In one narration, he actually fought the battle along with other Sahaba. Many Sahaba died in this battle. Many Sahaba were killed by the Umayyad army. So there's a particular narration that uh, Imam, Imam Shamsuddin al-Dhahabi rahmatullahi alayhi quotes that a person, there was a particular Shami, a Shami person. He narrates, he says that دَخَلَ أَبُوْ سَعِيدٍ يَوْمَ الْحَرَّةِ غَارًا that Abu Sa'id al-Khudi radiallahu anhu fought for a bit and after that he went into a cave to stay away from the battle. Too many Sahaba were dying, too many innocent people were dying. So he went into a cave. فَدَخَلَ عَلَيْهِ فِيهِ رَجُلٌ ثُمَّ خَرَجَ فَقَالَ لِرَجِلٍ مِنْ أَهْلِ الشَّامْ أَدُلُّكَ عَلَى رَجُلٍ تَقْتُلُهُ So one person came and saw him sitting in the cave. He went back outside and then he saw a Shami soldier and he said to him, let me take you to a man. You should kill him. He's from the opposition army. You fight for the Umayyads, go there and kill him. So that Shami, فَلَمَّا إِنْتَهَا الشَّامِيُّ إِلَىٰ بَابِ الْغَارِ وَفِي عُنُقِ أَبِي سَعِيدٍ أَسَّيْفُ قَالَ لِأَبِي سَعِيدٍ أُخْرُجْ So that Shami person came to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, and Abu Sa'id was inside the cave, this person was standing right at the mouth of the cave. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anh had his sword hanging around his neck. The Shami man said to him, exit this cave. So he responded, وَلَا أَخْرُجْ I won't exit. وَإِن تَدْخُلْ أَقْتُلُكَ And if you come inside, وَإِن تَدْخُلْ أَقْتُلْكَ And if you do come inside, I will kill you. So the Shami man, فَدَخَلَ الشَّامِ عَلَيْهِ The Shami person entered into the cave. Now, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an said he would kill him. But it was this feeling that he didn't want to kill any more innocent people that he actually came to the cave. So he took his sword and put it on the ground. And he said to that person, I'm not going to kill you. If you wish, you can kill me and take my sin and your sin both back to Allah. Take, meaning, take my burden and your burden. The burden of killing me and also the burden of all the people that you're going to kill. Um, take my responsibility and your responsibility. And be from the people of the fire of hell. That person, when he heard this, the Shami person, he asked, Anta Abu Sa'id al Khudri? Are you Abu Sa'id al Khudri? The Shami person who was here to kill him, he asked him, Are you Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu an? Qala naam. Yes, that's me. So the Shami soldier said, Fastaghfirli. Ask Allah to forgive me. I've made a very, very big mistake by withdrawing my sword against the great companion of the Prophet. And then Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu an said to him, Ghafar Allah lak. May Allah forgive you. And that's where this incident ends. And the reason why the scholars quote this narration in his biography is to show that not only was he revered and loved by the Sahaba 
and those who are you know from that group of traditional you know uh, companionship those who are aware of the companions and whatnot but he was also beloved by the people who actually weren't so kind to other companions and those who actually had an intent to even kill someone like him his teachers and students his greatest teacher without doubt was the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that's who he narrates most of his narrations from but he also narrates from other companions like Abu Bakr Siddiq radiyallahu an, Umar radiyallahu an, and others. From his students, there were other companions, Jabir ibn Abdullah radiyallahu an narrates from him, Abdullah ibn Umar narrates from him, Zayd ibn Thabit radiyallahu an narrates from him, Ibn Abbas narrates from him, Ibn Zubair narrates from him, Abdullah ibn Zubair, Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu an narrates from him, from amongst the Tabi'oon, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, Abu Salma ibn Abdul Rahman, Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Utbah and Ata ibn Yasar and many more. The list is very long of students who actually narrate from him. And this, his students, they describe him as very, being a very righteous, pious person. Someone who was very particular and punctual in practicing the deen. Ghailan bin Shumaykh al-Ghailani says, Ataytu al-Madinata fantalaqtu ila Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu an." فَدَخَلْتُ عَلَيْهِ فَإِذَا شَيْخٌ كَبِيرٌ يُصَلِّ حِينَ زَالَةَ الشَّمْسُ مُعْتَمِدًا عَلَى جَرِيدَةٍ That I came to Medina Munawwara, and when I arrived in Medina, I went to visit Abu Sa'id al-Khudri رضي الله عنه. Now he was a senior companion. Abu Sa'id was now older in age. He said, when I entered into the room where Abu Sa'id was, فَإِذَا شَيْخٌ كَبِيرٌ There was this very old man. And he was praying salah right after zawal, meaning the sun had just passed. And he was praying his, uh, he was praying his salah. And while he was praying, he was leaning against, he was leaning against something. He was very old at the time. إِذَا قَامَ اِعْتَمَدَ عَلَيْهَا وَإِذَا رَكَعَ أَسْنَدَهَا إِلَى الْقِبْلَةِ That when he would, um, when he would stand up, he would use that 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 pillar or this this uh, this uh, branch, if you wish to say, to push himself up. And when he would go into rukur, he would put it in front of him and then bow down because that would help him balance when he would go into ruku'. When he would do sajda, he would lean on it, and he would go into sajda. وَإِذَا سَجْدَ جَافَ مِرْفَقَيْهِ عَنْ جَنْبَيْهِ حَتَّى أَرَابَ يَاضَ إِبْطَيْهِ He said when he would go into sajda, he would move his arms, his, the side of his arms, away from the side of his body, so there would be a gap between his body and his arms, and you would be able to see uh, his underarms, his armpit area when he would be in sajda. Abu Nadra, one of his students, he said that we said to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an, Ala naktubu ma nasma'u mink? Should we not write down everything we hear from you? You narrate so many ahadith. So he said, Turiduna an taj'aluha masahif, ihfadu minna kama hafidna. He said, what, you want to write it all down and write a journal or, or, write a journal, journal or something? He then told his students, rather than writing it down, memorize it just as we memorized it from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because when a person memorizes something, the only way to truly retain it is through revision and practice. If you write it down, who revises their notes? You just know that you know, you know that you wrote them down. They're somewhere in a book. You attend a weekend seminar, you take these very you know, detailed notes. What happens to those notes then? They get filed away into some cabinet. But when you memorize something, what do you know? Since it's not written, I have to revise it. And the best way to bring it into True preservation is by practicing it. So he's giving them that exact same model. Ihfadu minna kama hafidna. That re, uh, retain from us just as we retain from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. From amongst the narrations of Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu an, he says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "La yamna ahadukum makhafat al nas an yatakallam bil haqi ida raahu aw alimahu." قال أبو سعيد فحملني ذلك إلى على أن ركبت إلى معاوية فملأت أذنيه ثم رجعت. That I once heard the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying that you should not fear people and remain silent. One of you should not be held back from speaking the truth out of fear of people after you've seen something wrong. If you've seen something wrong happen, don't be afraid of people of what people are going to say. Speak your mind with wisdom, but speak your mind. How long will political correctness keep people silent? Will we not let our minds be, you know, speak? Will we not say what's in our heart? Will we not say what's wrong, call a spade a spade, and what's right, encourage it and say that's actually right? 
When you remain silent, you give someone else the opportunity to come and speak into the mic. And they can say whatever they want. If they fear Allah, they'll speak good. If they have no consciousness of Allah, they'll make a mess out of it. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu, he says, it was this hadith that motivated me to travel all the way to meet Muawiyah radiallahu an, And because there was a dispute between Muawiyah radiallahu an and Ali radiallahu an, he said, I came to Muawiyah radiallahu an, فَحَمَلَ لِذَلِكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ رَكَبْتُ, عَلَىٰ أن ركبت إِلَىٰ مُعَاوِيَةً فَمَلَأْتُ أُذُنَيْهِ I gave him an earful. Well, I had a lot of things that I wanted to say. I said it all to Muawiyah radiallahu an. Muawiyah radiallahu an was a leader, and he was also a sahabi. And this was common amongst the companions that they would you know, speak openly to one another. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an narrates in another hadith, as narrated by Imam Ahmad and others, that he says, قُتِلَ أَبِي يَوْمَ أُحَدْ شَهِيدًا That my father was martyred on the, on the, in the battle of Uhud. وَتَرَكْنَا بِغَيْرِ مَالِ And he left us with no wealth at all. فَأَتَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَسْأَلُهُ I came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to ask him for some wealth, because we were in need. فَحِينَ رَآنِي When the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم saw me, قال, he said, without me even having to say what I had to say, without even having to ask what I had to ask, the Prophet ﷺ turned to me and he said to me, مَنْ اسْتَغْنَى أَغْنَى اللَّهُ أَغْنَاهُ اللَّهُ وَمَنْ اسْتَعَفَّ يُعِفُّهُ اللَّهُ That whoever lives a chaste life, a life that abstains from asking from other people, a person who is independent, a person who lives a life like that, Allah will grant that person independence. Allah will keep that person chaste. Allah will save that person from asking from other people. And whoever lives a satisfied life, they're content with what they have. Istafa can mean also that person doesn't go around begging other people. The one who holds themselves back from begging from other people, Allah will keep that person pure and Allah will take care of that person. Abu Sa'id al-Khudi radiallahu anh says, I heard this from the Prophet of Allah, فَرَجَعْتُ I went back without even asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa for anything. Because I knew he was speaking to me. If I believed in Allah, if I trusted Allah, Allah would take care of my affairs. Hamdullah bin Abi Sufyan narrates, Kalam and Afqa, actually we, I quoted that hadith, that he was, uh, the statement that he was the most knowledgeable from the young companions. Khatib Baghdadi says that he was one of the companions who narrates the most ahadith, وَحَدَّثَ حَدِيثًا كَثِيرًا وَحَافِذَ حِفْظًا كَثِيرًا حَدِيثًا كَثِيرًا He had memorized many ahadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Maymun, uh, Muhaymin bin Abbas bin Sahal bin Sa'ad narrates from his father, who, from his grandfather, who says, Abu Sayyid al Khudri radiallahu anhu says, Ba'yatun Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ana wa Abu Dhar wa Ubadah bin Samit wa Muhammad bin Maslama wa Abu Sayyid al Khudri uh, wa Sadis. That there were six of us, he names five of them, doesn't mention the sixth person. He says, Five of us, we took allegiance at the hands of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the allegiance was that we would not fear any person. We wouldn't fear people accusing us or people speaking bad of us or people, you know, giving us a guilt trip, loma talaim, anyone that had anything to say. We wouldn't fear. We would say the truth if that's what was required. So he said, we all took that um, pledge at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. فَاسْتَقَالَ sadis, The sixth person, the one who he didn't name, he said, the, the sixth person came back to the Prophet of Allah and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I took this allegiance at your hand, but I don't think I can follow through with it. I don't have it in me. The other guys, maybe they can be very bold and they can say it. It's, I'm not sure if it's something that I can do. Fastaqala. Istaqala means to seek a return. Fa'aqala, who the Prophet ﷺ then said, You are relieved of this commitment and promise that you made. Do the best you can. As I mentioned earlier, Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu anh narrates, 1170 ahadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam out of which 34 sorry 43 are narrated by both Imam Bukhari and Muslim Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi independently narrates 16 of them and Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi independently narrates 52 of those narrations Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu an's daughter narrates she says that when my father's death came lamma hudira da'a nafaran min ashabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam when my father's death came, he called some companions, Fihim ibn Abbas, wa ibn Umar, wa Anas ibn Malik, wa Jabir ibn Abdullah, that amongst the people who came to my father while he was on his deathbed were the likes of Ibn Abbas, عن, Ibn Umar, عن, Anas ibn Malik, عن, Jabir ibn Abdullah, and he said that when I die, 
إِذَا أَنَا مُتُّ فَكَفِّنُونِي فِي ثِيَابِ الَّتِي كُنْتُ أُصَلِّيَ فِيهَا When I die, bury me in those garments that I used to pray salah in. وَأَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ فِيهَا And bury me in those garments that I used to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in. وَأَجْمِنُوا عَلَيَّ بِأُقِيَةِ He said, or مُجْمَر He then says, take some fragrance, you know, as it's the practice as well when a person dies, you apply some fragrance, some bakhur to the body to make sure the bad stench isn't there and, until they're buried. وَلَا تَضْرِبُوا عَلَىٰ قَبْرِ فُسْطَاطًا And don't erect any tent on my grave. And then he says, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُونِي بِنَارٍ And don't let a fire follow me. This was a practice they had. People would walk behind the deceased with uh, fire. He said, don't do that. وَإِذَا أَخْرَجْتُمُونِي فَلَا تَتَّبِعْنِي بَاكِيَةً And when, when you take my body to the uh, graveyard, don't let a lady follow me who will, be, who will wail over my death, who will cry. You know, these were professionals. Don't let any of these people join. Um, she then says that, فَفَعَلُوا مَا أَمَرَهُمْ بِهِ They did exactly as he said. Um, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu, what year did he pass away in? There's a difference of opinion. One group of scholars, they say he passed away in the year um, 74 after Hijrah. Another group of scholars, they say that he passed away in the year 63 after Hijrah. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi in Arabs from Ali rahimahullah ta'ala that he passed away not 63 after Hijrah, rather he says, Mata ba'd al harrati bi sanatin. He died after the battle of Harrah by one year. And if you recall, the battle of Harra occurred in 63 Hijri. Therefore, according to this opinion, he passed away in what year? 64 after Hijri. Now we come to the hadith itself. First thing, this hadith is a very special and unique hadith. The scholars have actually mentioned virtues for this hadith, a special rank of this hadith. Imam Abu Dawud rahmatullahi alayhi, he says, <clears throat> كتبت عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خمسة مئة ألف حديث. I have written from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم five hundred thousand hadith. Imam Abu Dawood the Sidistani. I've narrated. I've written how many hadith? Five hundred thousand hadith. إن تخبت منها ما تضمنه هذا الكتاب يعني كتاب السنن جمعت فيه أربعة آلاف وثمانية وثماني وثماني مئة حديث. He says, out of those 500,000, I selected 4,800 ahadith to be a part of my book, the Sunan of Imam Abu Dawood rahmatullahi alayhi, Sunan Abi Dawood. He said then, وَيَكْفِ الْإِنسَانُ لِدِينِهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ أَرْبَعَةٌ And out of these 4,800 ahadith, four ahadith are such that if a person preserves these four ahadith, they've basically taken the summary of my half million ahadith. And those four ahadith I listed for you multiple times already in this book. Because we covered each of those four ahadith in the Arba'in Nawi. Imam Nawi included each of those four ahadith one by one in this collection. But just to refresh your memory, the first hadith was the first hadith of this book, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ niyat. The second hadith, which is also a hadith in the Arba'in of Imam Nawi, مِنْ حُسْنِ إِسْلَامِ مِنْ مَرْءِ تَرْكُهُ مَا لَا يَعْنِي From the beauty of a person's faith is that they leave that which does not concern them. The third hadith is that a person is not a believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And the fourth hadith, the halal is clear, the haram is clear. So these are the four hadith. وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ أُخْرَى عَنْ However, there is another narration from Imam Abu Dawood that instead of these, uh, uh, Imam Abu Dawood rahmatullahi alayhi said, another narration, وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ أُخْرَى عَنْهُ أَنَّهُ قَالْ أَلْفِقْهُ يَدُورُ عَلَىٰ خَمْسَةِ أَحَادِيثِ Imam Abu Dawood rahmatullahi alayhi said, Islamic law is based on five ahadith. What are those five ahadith? The first one is, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are by intentions. The second one, الدِّينُ nasiha The religion is sincerity. The third one, مَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ وَمَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ فَأْتُوا مِنْهُ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ What I have told you to stay away from, avoid it. And what I have told you to do, do it to the best of your ability. The fourth one is الْحَلَالُ بَيِّنْ وَالْحَرَامُ بَيِّنْ The haram is clear, the haram is clear. The halal is clear, the haram is clear. And the fifth and last one is this hadith, 
لا ضرر ولا ضرارة There is a book called Al-Lam في أسباب ورود الحديث It's a very beautiful book because it's a book that consists of the stories and incidents that occurred <coughs> in response to which the Prophet sallallahu said certain statements of his. <coughs> so, regarding this particular hadith, la darara wa la dirar, he quotes from Qala Abdul Razak fil Musannaf. He quotes from Imam Ibn Abdul, Imam Abdul Razak in his Musannaf, saying that um, there was a date tree, kalat bayna rajulaini fakhta sama fiha. There was a, a palm tree that was disputed by two people. They brought their case to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One of the people he said that how long will we continue to fight over this tree? Who owns the tree? Who doesn't own the tree? So you know what? Let's just cut the tree in half. So in response to the other Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, لا ضرر ولا ذرار that there's no harm or reciprocating harm. What that means is that if we do cut the tree in half, who benefits from it? If you cut a tree in half, who benefits from it? No one does. There's no, there's no benefit of that. You know, you know, growing a tree requires effort. You know, the land, taking care of it, so much time, money, and effort goes into it. And you're just saying that the way we deal with this is just chop it into half. Two people are fighting over a house and they come to a judge and they say, well, the best way to deal with this is we take a saw and we saw the house into half. We go down the middle and we cut it. So in response to that, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا ضرر ولا ذرار You're harming yourself and you're harming others in doing this. What's the benefit in doing that? Imam uh, uh, Abdul Razak narrates this narration as the sabab al-wurud in his musannaf. Now this particular hadith comes with different language, different wording in different books of hadith. So in one narration, as Imam Hakim rahmatullahi alayhi narrates, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا ضرر ولا ذرار ومن ضر ضره الله ومن شاق شق الله عليه That there is no causing of harm or reciprocating harm. And whoever does harm another one, Allah will harm him. And whoever hurts another person, Allah or whoever makes it difficult, ومن شق شاق Whoever makes it difficult on another person, شق الله عليه Allah will make it difficult upon him. And another narration, that's been narrated by Imam Tirmidhi rahmatullahi alayhi from Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu an bi isnadin fihi dha'fun with a narration with a chain that has weakness in it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَلْعُونٌ مَنْ ضَارَ مُؤْمِنًا أَوْ مَكَرَ بِهِ That cursed is the one who harms a believer or tries to trick him. Cursed is the one who harms a believer or tries to trick him. And this particular narration, the, word, the wording is لَا ضَرَرَ وَلَا ذِرَارَ However, بِغَيْرِ uh, حَمْزَةً In another narration, uh, narrated by Imam Ibn Majah in Dar Qutni, it's لَا ضَرَرَ وَلَا إِذْرَارَ So there's a little, different, little difference in the, in the language. As we mentioned at the beginning of the class, Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi, after narrating this hadith, had a very brief discussion regarding the chain of the hadith. He said that it's a Hassan narration, but then he then said that Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi narrates it as a mursal riwayah. A mursal riwayah is that narration which does not have a continuous chain back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone is missing there, right? Mursal is a type of inqita. There is a discontinuity at some point in the chain. So the scholars have then looked at other variations of this hadith. And it seems as if in each variation in the sanad, there is someone there who is questionable. Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali discusses this issue at length, that he takes all the narrations that actually narrate this particular text, and he goes through each chain one by one, and he says, in this chain there is this person, in this chain there is this person, and one by one he dissects these chains, and Allah reward the ulama for going through this effort of going through each chain piece by piece, and very carefully uh, dissecting and examining them. However, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, after going through all of the different chains and criticizing them, he then closes off by saying, وَقَدْ ذَكَرَ الشَّيْخِ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ أَنَّ بَعْضَ تُرُقِهِ تَقْوَى بِبَعْضٍ That even though each chain has weakness in there, when you combine all of these weak chains together, it gains a sort of strength. There is a strength that comes into existence. When you have multiple weak narrations, and each narration is unique, it's not the same person in each narration, because then that's a problem. But there is a weakness in one narration because of a particular narrator. 
The second narration, it's sound all the way through until another narrator is a problem, but that, that narrator is different from the first narrator. Are you guys following me? So there are independent weaknesses in each chain, and there are multiple chains lined up. You can bring them all together, and then this weak narration will be upgraded into what we call Hassan. Hassan li ghayrihi actually. It'll get an upgrade where it becomes like a Hassan narration. So that's what he's saying right here. وَقَدْ قَالَ الْبَيْهَقِي فِي بَعْضِ أَحَادِيثِ كَثِيرِ بْنِ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ الْمُزَنِي Okay, so that's, you know, he continues on that. And Ibn Salah, رحمه الله تعالى, regarding this hadith, he says something very beautiful. هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسْنَدَهُ دَارُ قُطْنِي مِنْ وُجُوهٍ He says, Imam Dar Qutni, who was a master in hadith, Ibn Salah says, Imam Dar Qutni, who was a master in hadith, narrates this particular hadith to the Prophet through multiple through multiple avenues. وَمَجْمُعُهَا يُقَوِّ الْحَدِيثَ وَيُحَسِّنُهُ And when you gather all of those paths together, it creates a strength in the narration. It creates a beauty. It becomes hasan. It's an acceptable narration. وَقَدْ تَقَبَّلَهُ جَمَاهِرُ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ This narration has been accepted by a large group of people of knowledge. وَاحْتَجُّ بِهِ And they've used this hadith to derive legal rulings from وَقَوْلُ أَبِي دَاوُدْ And you remember at the beginning I quoted that, that, that statement of Imam Abu Dawood, how fiqh revolves around five ahadith. So now Ibn Salah is making reference to that statement of Imam Abu Dawood. He says, إِنَّهُ مِنَ الْأَحَادِيثِ الَّتِي يَدُورُ الْفِقْهُ عَلَيْهَا يُشْعِرُ بِكَوْنِهِ غَيْرَ ضَعِيفًا وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ The fact that Imam Abu Dawood is saying this is one of the five ahadith that fiqh revolves around, teaches us that Imam Abu Dawood, the master of hadith, did not view this hadith to be unacceptable. And therefore, the scholars of hadith have always accepted this hadith, and they've narrated it. So this is a discussion that they have regarding the particular chain. Now, we come to this hadith. Before I go into the uh, details of this hadith, and we dissect it down, linguistically break it down, and address what this hadith is actually saying, there are uh, a few things. The first thing is that this, this hadith is one of the qa'idah, this is one of the qawaid fiqhiyah. One of the qawaid fiqhiyah. Okay? So what does qa'idah mean? Anyone know? Not al-qa'idah. We're not talking about them. We're talking about a fiqhi qa'idah. What is a fiqhi qa'idah? A fiqhi maxim or principle. A qa'idah is hukman shari'iyun. It's a legal ruling which repeats itself as a reference point again and again through the deen. That becomes a principle. So it's a maxim that is re regularly, frequently made reference to. You'll find that the scholars, for example, they'll have a discussion in fiqh, and there are some, some maxims that they'll commonly mention. For example, they'll say, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ That's one of the maxims. الْأُمُورُ بِمَقَاسِدِهَا That's the actual language. So while they're discussing fiqh, it's very regular, very common for the fuqaha in the middle of a discussion to say, and our reference point is what? Al-umur bi maqasidiha, or innama al-amalu bin niyat. They'll constantly make reference to it. This is a principle, and from this principle, think of the qawaid kind of like a mother. It gives birth to many uh, rulings, many legal rulings. It's like the ocean, it's the sea, where many streams will take birth from. Understanding the qawaid fiqhiyah is mandatory for anyone who wishes to appreciate and understand Islamic law. Islamic law is not, at least the schools of thoughts that relate to Islamic law, the Hanbali, Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanafi, or in chronological order, the Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanbali schools of thoughts, are not necessarily about the, the rulings that are within them. These schools of thoughts exist because each one has a set of rulings that they rely on to derive their rulings, to derive the answers. These are called the usul, they have principles. They all have principles. Each madhab is unique from the next in its principles. Because their principle is unique, that's why their research is unique. You know, I always give this example to people. Whenever someone comes to me and says to me that the Qur'an is one, the hadith is one, why do we have multiple practices in the deen? People say this all the time. And there was a time where if someone's made a statement like this, people would say, wow, that's a very intellectual statement. You know, that's a hardcore question right there. If the Qur'an is one, if the hadith is one, why do we have multiple schools of thought? Personally, I find this statement to be very silly and foolish. 
I feel like only this person, only a person would make a statement like this who has never engaged in research or taken like a psychology class in their life. If you've ever taken a psych class, or you've taken a class on research methodology, if you've ever written a thesis or a research paper, one of the first things you have to establish are your parameters of research, your, method of, your, your research methodology. How are you performing this research? If you have four people researching the exact same body of data, but different methodologies, can they come to different conclusions? Absolutely. It's the most obvious thing. It happens in every science. The data is one, four different research methodologies. What's going to happen? You will surely have four different conclusions. And if the conclusion is one, that happens to be coincidental. The reason is because they came to the same conclusion, but the routes they took to, came there were, they took to come there were very different. I'll give you an example. According to the Hanafi school of thought, when you're doing tayammum, you have to make intention. When you're doing wudu, you don't have to make intention. So according to the Hanafi school of thought, if someone was walking and their friend pushed them into a pool and they got out, they have wudu. You guys understand? The guy didn't have wudu. What did his friend do? Go ahead. He pushed him into the pool. This guy is so kept to toe. He gets out, his wudu was done. Because according to the Hanafi position, wudu is not necessary for amal ghair maqsuda. Right? Which is a more technical issue, but for, simple, for simple, a simple issue, simple discussion, wudu does not require an intention according to the Hanafi school of thought. According to the Shafi'i position, wudu does require intention. So if there were two Shafi'i buddies walking together, and one person pushes the other one inside the pool, and he didn't have wudu, when he gets out, does his wudu count? It doesn't count. Why doesn't it count? Because he didn't have intention. So that's one masala. Now the one I want you to focus on for a moment is the second one. Tayammum is a practice that we commonly translate in English as dry ablution. It's your wudu without water. When you don't have water, you use soil to purify yourself. You dab your hand into the soil, kind of remove the soil and wipe your hands over your arms and wipe them over your face. Tayammum darbatan. So, now for tayammum, do you need intention or not? The Shafi'i school of thought maintaining consistency with their wudu position. So for wudu, what do they say? Do you need wudu? Do you need intention? Yes. For, so for tayammum, what are they going to say? Yes, you need intention. The Hanafis, what do they say? They say you need intention for tayammum. Now, it seems like the Shafi'is and Hanafis agree here. Would you guys agree? Yes or no? They're both saying the same thing. That for tayammum, you do need wudu. However, note that I said it seems like. Because in result, they agree. How they came there is two different journeys. The Shafi'is came to this conclusion by quoting the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Because they say that, إِنَّمَا تَصْحِيحُ الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ That indeed the acceptance of a, a deed or the correction, the validity of a good deed is based on the intention. So if there's no intention, the, the action is invalid. The wudu would be invalid and the tayammum would be invalid. So how do they come to this conclusion? Using what? The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Inna mal amalu bin niyat. The Hanafi school of thought. They said that for amal ghair maqsuda, amal ghair maqsuda or ibadat ghair maqsuda refers to those acts of worship that aren't worship in themselves, but they are an avenue for another act of worship to occur. So if you just sat in the wudu area and did a hundred wudu straight, would you get rewarded for that? If you sat for three hours in the, in the wudu area, and you just kept doing wudu after wudu, would you get reward for that? Yes or no? No, you would not get wudu. You would not get reward. Your wudu would count. You wouldn't get the reward though. Because wudu is only an act of worship because it connects you to salah. The main ibadah is actually what? Salah. So they say for, for ibadah ghair maqsuda, which isn't a, a, an ibadah, and it, it's not the intended ibadah, wudu. It, the intended ibadah is salah. Wudu is an avenue to pray salah. You don't, need, you don't need intention. Now someone can say, but then what about tayammum? Tayammum is ibadah ghayr maqsuda. Would you agree? Tayammum in itself is not a worship. It's a, it's, a, it's a worship that connects you to another worship. So the answer to that, the Hanafi scholars, they say the reason why we need an intention in tayammum is because of the, legal me- the, the, the literal meaning of the word tayammum. The literal meaning of the word tayammum in Arabic means at-tayammum huwa al-qasd. At-tayammum an niyyah the word tayammum means what? To make an intention. So therefore the intention is necessary. Allah says, فَتَيَمَّمُوا سَعِدًا A 
the, you know, make a qasd, make a niya towards doing your, uh, when, you're go, when you go to perform your dry ablution. Now, don't get caught with the fiqhi ruling. This isn't a fiqh class. I'm trying to help you understand how usul work. Every madhab has a different set of usul. The Malikis have different usul. The Hanbalis have different usul. The Shafi'is have different usul. The Hanafis have different usul. As a practitioner or someone who practices a madhab, if you are someone who's looking for a madhab, the ideal way to do it would be to go to the madhab and study their usul. What's actually happening here? How many of us are actually Hanafis, Shafi'is, Malikis, or Hanbalis, and we have no idea what the usul are? How many Shafi'is will you find who will have no idea why Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi changed his whole madhab when he arrived in Egypt? Why did, his, why, did, why, did, why did his mind change? Why did he go from the Qawl Qadim to Qawl Jadid? This is, a, this is a turning point for the Shafi'i Madhab. Imam Shafi'i, he moves, arrives in Egypt, and what happens to his fiqh? The whole thing turns. Why does Imam Malik Rahmatullahi Ali give certain rulings that are not common amongst people like Imam Shafi'i and Imam Ahmad? Because his methodology is different. The Hanafis have a different methodology. So each Madhab, each legal school is based on methodologies. This is important for you to know. Now there are five major principles, five qawaid kubra they call them. So there are principles within each madhab, but then within these principles there are five qawaid, five principles that are very important. Okay? And these five principles will help you navigate through your entire religion. What are these five principles? The first one, as I mentioned, al-umur bi maqasidiha. That actions are based on their intentions. And this is based off of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ The first hadith that we, we, we quoted. The second one is the hadith, of, uh, uh, the, the second maxim is the statement, قَاعِدَ uh, الْيَقِينَ لَا يَزُولُ بِالشَّكْرِ الْيَقِينَ لَا يَزُولُ بِالشَّكْرِ That certainty cannot be removed by doubt. Certainty can only be removed by certainty itself. A person feels some rumbling in their stomach, they feel a little movement in their stomach, their wudu won't break until they can be certain that they passed when. This is something we've discussed already in our classes previously, so I won't spend too much time on it. The second, the third one is al-dhararu yuzal, which is based off this hadith. la dharar wa la dirar. That any sort of harm that's in play will be removed. al-dhararu yuzal. Any sort of harm that's in play. If the sharia notices that someone's getting harmed, if there's a qadi or a judge, he notices someone's being harmed. If there is a, you know, someone in a position of responsibility, a person who manages a business, the head of the household, this person notices that someone is being harmed, what's the principle? What's the immediate knee-jerk reaction? Al-dhararu yuzal. The harm must be removed. If someone's in pain, you have to go and help them. The sharia must find a way to accommodate a person that is struggling. Al-dhararu yuzal. The fourth one is al-ada muhkam, which means that um, the norms of society are legislated. So, what is norm? What are the norms and, and, and the practices in society? As long as they don't violate the Sharia, they will be included as a as an extension into the Sharia. Are you guys following? The norms are considered in Islamic law. Okay, um, if there's something that's that's becoming a common practice in Sharia, the scholars will include it and they will be very considerate. And that's what makes Islamic law timeless. That's what makes our Sharia applicable to all cultures and times and all places in the world. Because our Sharia does a very good job at adopting culture, a phenomenal job. Every time I go to an event where I see a flyer and I'm speaking on Islam versus culture, the first opening statement I make is that this is not, there's no verses, there's no boxing match happening here, Islam versus culture. They don't hate each other. Religion is not against culture. If anything, Islam as a religion does a phenomenal job at accommodating culture. This is not some sort of Ken versus Rayu where they're just constantly fighting one another. This is, our deen does a very good job um, at being broad and accommodating culture. And the last one, Al-Mashaqqa Tajlibu Taysir. Which is very, which is kind of similar to um, Al-Dharur Yuzal. Al-Mashaqqa Tajlibu Taysir. What that means is that if a person is in a situation where there is a difficulty, the Sharia will create an ease for them again. There will be some ease that will come into play. 
so that difficulty can, 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 can be removed. And then with, within each of these <coughs> maxims, there are sub qaidas So there are these five major qaid fiqhiyya kubra, the major uh, fiqhi rulings. And then within each one, there are smaller legal rulings that fall beneath them. I won't go through all of them. Um, the reason is because if I go through them, this will become a very detailed and lengthy class. For example, regarding al-umuru bi maqasidiha, that um, actions are by their intentions, one of the qawaida, one of the qawaid underneath that qaida is the statement, لا ثواب إلا بنيتن, that there is no reward without an intention. That's a maxim, that's a principle. The Shafi'is, Imam Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi, he writes in his Al-Ashbah wa Nadair, that aniyyatu shartun li sihhat al-a'mal, another sub-principle that he brings underneath there, that intention is a condition for the validity of an action, that was, that's the Shafi'i position. Al-yaqeen la yazulu bi shak that certainty cannot be removed by doubt, this is a maxim, and one of the sub-maxims underneath this, al-aslu baqa'u ma kana ala ma kan, that whatever was certain, until another certain thing will come and move, will change the certainty or change the ruling, you will continue to practice this the way you did. I know that sounds very confusing because I think it, I said it in a very confusing way. But I'll give you an example. A person was certain that they had a wudu. Al-aslu baqa'u ma kan ala ma kan. That the pers- a person was in the state of wudu, they have doubt. Did I break my wudu or not? So the doubt doesn't change certainty. Do we agree on that? So therefore, a sub-principle will be, you will continue to practice the certainty. Which means you have wudu, go and touch the Qur'an, go and do your tawaf, go and pray your salah, you're the way you were. Okay, I mean, I don't want to go through all of them. Let's go to the hadith. There are so many qawaid, إِذَا ضَاقَ الْأَمْرُ إِتَّسْعَى لَا وَاجَبَ عَلَى الْعَاجِزِ الضرر يدفع قدر الإمكان تدفع على المفسدتين بإرتكاب أدناهما These are all قواعد and principles and there's a lengthy discussion for each one. You know, what's, what's interesting and beautiful about this particular hadith that Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi brings in this hadith collection is that this is one of the first times where Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi is diving nose into fiqh. So far if you've noticed, Imam Nawawi hasn't gone into fiqh in this hadith collection. A lot of spirituality, a lot of intention stuff, Bid'ah, we talked about, you know, there were different things that he touched on, but this is one hadith that he goes right into fiqh. It's as if he's trying to show us that fiqh is a very important part of the deen. And in order to understand fiqh, he doesn't just bring a fiqhi hadith, he brings a hadith that relates to usul, that you have to understand the usul. And the principle of this deen is la dharar wa la dirar. You should not bring harm to yourself, neither should you inflict harm on anyone else. And this hadith is so beautiful because when you think of it, it teaches us that the deen isn't only interested in preserving the individual, but it's interested in preserving society. So not only can you not harm yourself, not only is the religion preserving you as an individual, but it's telling you you have a responsibility to preserve society. You have to make sure your actions do not cause harm to another person. Anytime your actions cause harm to another person, what you're doing is now wrong. You have to stop doing it. Remember what I said to you. If there is harm in the picture, الضرر yuzal. If there is harm that can be seen by any person, the knee-jerk reaction is what? How do I get rid of this harm? I have to stop it. You know, you're driving on the highway, you cut someone off. And you cut them off very tightly. Did you put that person in harm? Yes or no? Sure. Which means that action of yours was now not permitted. It was a wrong thing to do. Not only are you not supposed to put yourself in harm, you cannot put other people in harm. Someone drives very fast without wearing their seatbelt, they're putting themselves in harm. Someone drives irresponsibly and you know, they have passengers in the car seat. Not only uh, passengers in the car. Not only are they putting themselves at harm, what are they doing? The people next to them are also put at harm. La varar wa la dirar. Any time you see harm in society, you will see this. You know, you can't harm yourself. Neither can you harm other people. Sometimes what will happen is that a person wants to harm themselves to help another person. That's not permitted. La dharar, you can't harm yourself. And at times, la dirar, you know, a person is benefiting themselves at the cost of harming other people. And this is very common actually. 
people becoming wealthy off of the sweat and blood of other people. Off the sweat and blood of other, other individuals. La virad, you can't harm another person. So let's come to the hadith itself. What is happening in this hadith? So, Imam Al-Harali, he says, as narrated by Imam Al-Munawi rahmatullahi alayhi in his Fayd al-Qadir, that, أَذَّرُّ وَذُّرُّ بِالْفَتْحِ وَالضَّمْ مَا يُؤْلَمُ الظَّاهِرْ مِنَ الْجِسْمِ وَمَا, يطل وما يَطَّصِلُ بِمَحْسُوسِهِ فِي مُقَابِلَةِ الْأَدَى وَهُوَ فِي إِلَامُ النَّفْسِ وَمَا يَطَّصِلُ بِأَحْوَالِهَا So he says, he, in order to explain this word, he brings two words. He brings the word ضَرَر and then he brings the word أَذَى which both can be translated into English very loosely as to cause harm to another person. Ada, to cause harm or pain to a person. However, here Imam Harali says that there is a difference. Ada, ada is that which it is that pain or harm that's caused to the feelings of a person, to the inner self of a person. It doesn't leave a physical trace. You curse at someone. Is there any physical bruise on someone's body? No. That's why the Qur'an says, لَا تُبْطِلُوا صَدَقَاتِكُمْ بِالْمَنِّ وَالْأَذَى That don't void your sadaqa, your charity, um, through adha. What does that mean? Through words that you keep reminding that person. Remember I gave you charity? Remember that pizza I got you? Remember that pizza I got you? You keep saying it. Now, the nature of adha is that when you look on the body, are there going to be any, any marks there? No. But if you look into this person's heart, will you see marks there? Very deep. As for dharar, <clears throat> مَا يُؤْلَمُ الظَّاهِرُ مِنَ الْجِسْمِ Dharar is that pain or that ill which leaves a trace on the body. It's very physical. It's not just, we're not just talking about emotionally saving your brother from abuse, which Imam Nabawi has already covered. مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ يَسْمُطْ Whoever believes in Allah in the last day should speak good or remain silent. That he already covered. So that's not what he's talking about here. Here he's talking about physical harm. La dharar, you can't cause physical harm to yourself. Wala dharar, and you cannot cause physical harm to other people. Now, regarding, because in this hadith, you'll notice, if you, if you focus on the Arabic, you'll notice that the, the nakira form is used. There is no, um, it's not a specified noun. It's not a specific noun. It's a very general common noun. And because it's a common noun, the deen is negating all types of dharar. All types of harm is prohibited. The scholars, they say, وَفِيهِ تَحْرِيمُ سَائِرِ أَنْوَاعِ الضَّرَرِ إِلَّا بِدَلِيلٍ لِأَنَّ النَّكِرَ فِي سِيَاقِ النَّفِي تَعُمُّ Because in the language, there is a general usage of the, of, the, of the noun and the verb. Therefore, all sorts of harm are absolutely prohibited. إِلَّا بِدَلِيلٍ Until you can establish through a proof that this harm is permitted. For example, um, a person commits zina. Now the qadi gives a permission that these people will be lashed. Now someone can get up and say to the qadi that la dharar wa la dirar, you can't harm yourself, you can't harm others. And you're going to lash these people? In the deen, if we see any harm, we have to stop it. And you're going to hurt someone physically? We can't allow this to happen. So the Muslim judge, the Qadi, will respond back by saying, إِلَّا بِدَلِيلٍ Unless there is proof for it. And this sort of harm, punishing someone for this act, is proven. And then he will quote, cite the ahadith, and cite the verses of the Qur'an. Now, this raises another question, which is a very big question. The Mu'tazila raised this question actually, it's a very old debate. Can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislate something on mankind that will harm them? You guys, you guys understand the question? Can Allah legislate something on human beings that will harm them? So the answer to this is this. If there is something that apparently seems to be harming to the human being, then the benefit will always outweigh the harm. And therefore that's why Allah has told us to do it. Someone might do research and say, fasting can harm the body. Let's just say, I'm just making this up. Someone might do research and say what? Fasting can harm the body. The response to that will be that there may be one element of fasting that can harm the body, but there are a hundred different elements that benefit the body, spiritually and physically. I recall I was at a naturopathic clinic in India, and the doctor that I was speaking to, he made this statement. 
he said something on the lines of people who have acidity, fasting can never be good for them. I don't know why your religion is saying this. He was kind of taking a jab at me, you know. Uh, I don't know why your religion tells people to fast. So my answer to that person was exactly this. That from one perspective, from your research, you're saying that it harms people, which I'm not sure I agree with or disagree with. That's not my place to agree or disagree. But what I can say is that in our deen, we have qalaid fiqhiya. We have a very robust Islamic law system. So you can't just pull one ruling and throw it at me and say that well, I don't know why religion says fasting is a good thing. Well, from my research, your type of fasting is wrong. First thing, fasting is generally good for people. There's a lot of research. You're a physician, go and read it. Secondly, you're claiming that if someone um, who has acidity, that fasting can harm them and increases whatever, blah, 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 and it hurts them, then in that case, our sharia has a concept. Al-mashaqqat tajribu taysir. That if a person has an illness which causes difficulty, then Islam doesn't force them to fast and die in that process. What does Islam tell them? Defer the fast. Either do it at a time where it's more suitable for you, in the days that are shorter, or give a fidya on behalf of it. You know, you would give a, a, a charity on behalf of your fast. So Islam is a very full proof. The Islamic law is very robust. If there's one place that there's difficulty, there is another solution that comes right into place. There isn't a place where there's just a hole. There's no black hole in the religion. Our deen is very full like that. Alhamdulillah. Walhamdulillah. Thumma alhamdulillah. So the scholars, they say, if at any point, there is a ruling given that seems to be harming a person, the benefits will always outweigh the good. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to do this. And the Qur'an says, regarding this, Asa an takarahu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum. There are times that you will dislike something, you'll feel like you're being harmed, when in reality it's good for you. Someone can question, what good could there be in penal law? Islam's penal law is very strict. You know, uh, lashing, at times there could be the death penalty, at times there could be, you know, a prison uh, up to the choice of the qadi, the judge. There could be amputating of a limb. So someone can say, what, what kind of peaceful religion is this? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding qisas and hudud in the Qur'an says, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاسِ حَيَاتٌ يَا أُولِ الْأَلْبَابِ O people of intellect, in these punishments there is life. You give someone a strict punishment, what does everyone else learn? Don't do that act. You will be dealt with very seriously. You go to these countries, many of the countries where Islamic law is being implemented, and I, a lot of the countries in the world where Islamic law is being implemented, it's all biased. So I'm not sure if there is any country that I can make reference to and be confident of. But let's go to a hypothetical world where there was a world, and we're not talking about a country, we're, thinking, we're talking about an idea now. Okay? Let's go back to Medina Munawwara, the Prophet's time. In Medina Munawwara, did you have any... Now, this is not an idea, this is a reality. In Medina Munawwara, did you have any police walking around uh, handcuffing people? Yes or no? No. There was a concept of taqwa. Consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People were, were well versed in the Qur'an. Those who violated the law of the Qur'an were dealt with according to the Qur'an. Everyone knew that actions had consequences. They feared the consequences, therefore they avoided those actions. The Medinan society was a very safe community. It was one of the safest places in the world. Umar radiallahu anh as a khalifa had a total number of how many guards protecting him 24 hours a day? Take a wild guess, 100, 200, 500, 1,000 people? They say the president, for him to uh, you know, travel, it, takes, it costs almost like a few hundred thousand dollars. Every day his family lives in New York, it costs a million dollars on, on, on taxpayer money. Because that's how much security is given. Umar radiallahu anh, how much security was dedicated, how much money was dedicated, how much of the budget was dedicated to his security? A whopping zero. Nothing. Because Medina Munawwara was a very safe place. Because when you're just, that will bring people to the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now sometimes, dharar, harm can occur while knowing, and sometimes you may harm someone without knowing. Both can happen. Sometimes you may harm someone without knowing. Now if you harm someone without knowing, unknowingly you harm someone, then without any doubt, that person is not punishable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is not accountable. Rufi'ah an ummati al khata wa nisyan. Because Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, mistakes and forgetfulness are pardoned from my ummah, from my nation. Allah will forgive us. 
So anything that's done unknowingly. An example of this, a person has a tree, and his trees are all lined up in his farm, at the edge of his farm, right next to the next person's farm. And that person at the edge of his farm, he also has some crops there. They're not trees, he has a different type of crop. In our example, it's going to be a crop that's water sensitive, not too much water, it needs a little water. And trees, we know, do they need a little water or a lot? They need a lot of water. So this person has trees that require a lot of water, and right at the border of his property line, and the next property line, the person has some um, uh, vegetation or some crops there that require minimal water. He's dumping water on his trees, as a result of that, the water is hitting the plants, and what is it doing it to those, that, that, those crops? It's destroying them. So he's causing varar, he's causing harm to that person. Is he doing it willingly or unwillingly? He's doing it unwillingly. So as I mentioned, he won't be accountable by Islamic law, he won't be accountable by Allah. However, the qadi, the judge, the two individuals must find a way to end the dharan. The harm must be removed. The knee-jerk reaction to sharia is, if someone is being harmed, we don't just say it's your problem. Because someone could say that. He can say, I'm watering, I'm watering the trees on my line, on my property. Is that a first statement? Can he make that statement, yes or no? He can make that statement. The trees on my property, I'm watering my tree. If your crops get destroyed, move them. None of my business. He can make that statement. But it's as if this hadith is going beyond just what's halal and haram. This hadith is teaching us accountability within the halal. That just because it's halal doesn't mean you can do it. The qadi can come and put a stop to these trees, he can uproot them all. He can send people in and say, uproot all these trees. Either you stop watering them, or you guys come to an agreement where you maybe help finance that person you know, uh, uh, to cultivate and, and, and to put some trees right next to your trees so that way his crops don't get destroyed. Or if you don't stop and you continue doing this, the qadi can, in some scenarios, do what? Command that the trees be uprooted and, and removed from there so that the, the neighbor isn't harmed in any way. So this hadith, la dharar wa la dirar, it takes us into a new dimension of the halal. It's a dimension of you can't just do whatever you want. If you're doing something, harm someone. If you're listening to, you're watching TV and you have that volume cranked up and you're in an apartment building, someone is on top of you, underneath you, to your right, to your left, and in front of you. And you've cranked that up. Can you say that, oh, it's my apartment, it's my property, I turn the volume up, you can't do anything to me. Can someone make that claim? Maybe they can. But Islam says, la varar, you can't do that. Because you're causing harm to your neighbors. And you need to turn that volume down. If you want to listen to something loud, go, put your, go buy yourself some nice Bluetooth um, headphones and sit in and crank the volume up and go deaf if you want to while listening to whatever loud thing it is that you're listening to. And sometimes a person causes dharar uh, intentionally. And there are so many examples of people causing dharar intentionally. You know, um, you get into an argument with your neighbor. You get into an argument with your neighbor. So what do you do? You wait, you know that your neighbor takes a nap during midday, and right when your neighbor goes to his room, you start mowing your lawn. So in your mind, what are you thinking? Not that I need to cut my grass, it's actually a bad time to cut my grass, it's the midday, who cuts their grass at 12 o'clock? A fool does that. You're supposed to cut your grass in the, mo grass in the morning or, or towards the evening. But why is he doing it in midday? Not because the grass needs it, but because he wants to bother his neighbor. Okay, so this sort of dharar, is, uh, is disliked and, and uh, actually absolutely haram. You're actually accountable by Allah for doing this because your intention is to harm another person. Now this particular hadith, la dharar wa la dirar, has been interpreted by the scholars in different ways. There's, I'm not sure if I should go into this. Okay, very briefly. The way I've been translating this hadith so far is the most accepted interpretation of this hadith. I've been translating this hadith in a very particular way. La dharar I've been translating as no causing harm to yourself. And la dirar, no reciprocating harm, no causing harm to other people. That is a particular definition. وَقِيلَ الضَّرَرُ أَنْ يُدْخِلَ عَلَىٰ غَيْرِهِ ضَرَرًا بِمَا يَنْتَفِعُ هُوَ بِهِ وَالضِّرَارُ أَنْ يُدْخِلَ عَلَىٰ غَيْرِهِ ضَرَرًا بِلَا مَنْفَعَةٍ لَهُ 
So one opinion, some scholars they say, dharar means, another, this is, so there's another opinion, the scholars they say, dharar means to harm another person for something in a way that you benefit. So dharar is a harm which actually brings a benefit with it. That I benefit from harm, harming that person. Therefore, la dharar. The Prophet is saying, don't harm someone at the cost of benefiting yourself. And dhirar, they say, and yudkhila ala ghayrihi dhararan bila manfa'atin lahu. Is to harm someone just for kicks. I'm turning the volume up, why? I just want to bother that person. I just want to annoy them. That's why I'm doing it. You know, I'm ordering pizza for them and making them pay in cash so that they have to pay. You know, I'm just pranking them for no reason. So la dharar, according to one interpretation, is to harm someone while benefiting yourself. La dharar means harming someone while not benefiting anyone at all. You're just doing it for the sake of doing it. This is the وَرَجَّحَ هَذَا الْقَوْلْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ ابن عَبْدِ الْبَرْ وَابْنُ الصَّلَاحِ Ibn Salah and Ibn Abd al-Bar have chosen this particular translation. وَقِيلَ أَذَّرَرُ أَنْ يَذُرَّ بِمَنْ لَا يَذُرُّهُ وَالذِّرَارُ أَنْ يَذُرَّ بِمَنْ قَدْ أَذَرَّ بِهِ عَلَى وَجْهٍ غَيْرِ جَائِزٍ They say another interpretation of the word لا ضرر and ولا ذرار They say لا ضرر is to harm someone who hasn't harmed you. Again, you're just harming them for the sake of it. And la dhirar means to harm someone who has harmed you in a haram way. Someone did something haram, something impermissible to harm you, so you harm them back. That's called dhirar. Dharar means to harm someone. A dhararu an yadurra biman la yadurruhu. Dharar is to harm someone who hasn't done anything to you, according to another interpretation. Wa dhirar an yadurra biman qad adarra bihi ala wajhin ghairi jaiz. And dhirar is to harm someone who has harmed you in an impermissible and inappropriate way. Okay, now regarding this dharar, as I mentioned earlier, there are two types of dharar. The first is that you're doing it just to hurt someone. What's the first intention behind the dharar? You're doing it just to hurt someone. The second type of dharar is, you're not doing it to hurt someone, you're doing it for your own benefit, but while doing that, someone else is getting hurt. I don't care about you getting hurt or not, hurt, not being hurt. I'm doing it for my own benefit. So there are two types of dharar. One, in which it, which in, with intention you're trying to hurt someone. In the Qur'an, when Allah talks about dharar, it's usually in the first context, where you are revengeful, and you're just hurting someone for the sake of hurting them, with the intention of hurting them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, مِن بَعْدِ وَصِيَّةٍ يُصَى بِهَا أَوْدَيْنْ غَيْرَ مُضَارٍ The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa, verse number 12, that غَيْرَ mudar don't cause dharar to people when distributing your wasiyah. When distributing their inheritance, don't cause harm to people. Be just. The context, context of this particular verse, as narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu an, he narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَيَعْمَلُ بِطَاعَةِ اللَّهِ سِتِّينَ سَنَةً Sometimes a person does good deeds, obeys Allah for 60 years. How many years? 60 years a person obeys Allah. ثُمَّ يَحْضُرُهُ الْمَوْتِ And then when death comes, فَيُضَارُ فِي الْوَصِيَّةِ فَيَدْخُلُ النَّارِ And then right before he dies, he does dharar in wasiyah. Wasiyah means in his inheritance, he does dharar. Meaning he messes around. He doesn't distribute according to how Allah told him to. He messes around in that, and he did 60 years of good deeds, but because he botches up right here and plays with the Qur'an right before his death, and violates the command of Allah right before his death, the result of that is such that he will go to the fire of hell. ثُمَّ تَلَى And then he said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited um, the ayah, تِلْكَ حُدُودُ الله, The verse of Surah Nisa, verse number 13, all the way until, وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَهُ يُدْخِلُهُ نَارًا خَالِدًا فِيهَا And he recited this verse as well. All these verses were then recited that this is a form of idrar, so causing pain. What are examples of this? I'll give you two examples of harming people when it comes to inheritance. وَالْإِذْرَارُ فِي الْوَسِيَّةِ تَارَةً يَكُونُ بِأَنْ يَخُصَّ بَعْضَ الْوَرَثَةِ بِزِيَادَةٍ عَلَىٰ فَرْضِهِ الَّذِي فَرَضَهُ اللَّهُ لَهُ فَيَتَذَرَّرُ بَقِيَّةُ الْوَرَثَةِ بِتَخْسِيسِهِ 
ولهذا قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله قد أعطى كل ذي حق حقه فلا وصية لوارث That a person has three sons and a daughter. He loves his daughter more. Fathers always love their daughters more. So he says to his sons, you guys are scum, forget you guys. I'm only going to give you guys 10 bucks each and I'm going to give $80,000 to my daughter. So what is he doing? He's giving his daughter more than the sons. And because he's doing this, where is the dharar, where is the harm? The sons, they're losing out. And in many cases it's a flip. Where the, the father is saying, I'm going to give the money to the sons, but I won't give it to my daughter. So who's losing out? The daughter is losing out. What this person is doing is absolutely haram, it's wrong. This person will be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for doing this. Because you're causing harm to a person. Another example, um, there is a person who you want to bequest money to. In Islam, there are people who inherit from you because the Qur'an has given them a portion. You want to give money to your friend. Is, the Quran, is a friend an inheritor in the Qur'an? He's not one of the Qur'anic inheritors. But there's a friend of yours, you want to give him some money. Can you leave him some money behind? Of course you can. How much can you leave behind? Up to one-third of your remaining wealth. Up to how much? What did I say? Thuruth. Up to one-third. And the Prophet ﷺ said, a thuruthu wa thuruthu kathir. One-third is, a, you can give up to one-third, and even one-third is a lot. You know, ideally less than one-third. Now this guy loves his friend so much, he gives him eight-tenths of his wealth. He gives him all of his wealth more or less. Now again, there's a, there's a dharar there. The dharar is, you favored your friend while harming all the other family members. That action, is it permissible or not? It's not permissible, you cannot do that. An example of dharar when it comes to revoking, revoking divorce. This is a very common example the fuqaha give, a very common example. In Islam, when a person, when a man divorces his wife, the lady goes into something we call a idda. The idda is a, a waiting period, which usually is three menstrual cycles, so for the sake of math, to make calculations simple, 90 days. How many days waiting period is she going to go into? Nine zero, 90 days. Now the husband and wife didn't get along, they got into a lot of argument, and the husband gives her a divorce. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, إِمْسَاكُمْ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ تَسْرِيحٌ بِإِحْسَانٍ Either live appropriately together, or separate in an appropriate way. Don't do dhulm and don't oppress one another. وَلَا تُمْسِكُوهُنَّ ذِرَارًا لِتَعْتَدُوا and don't hold them back, trying to cause them harm, so that you oppress them. Don't hold them into your marriage. Don't hold your wife or your husband into the marriage, harming them, so that you can oppress them and transgress their right. And whoever does this sort of an act, where he doesn't divorce his wife, and he prolongs the marriage unnecessarily, and he knows the wife is trying to get khula, but that's gonna take a while. If the wife wants to exit the marriage, she has to go through a process. She has to apply for a marriage annulment with the ulama in the community. The scholars will review the case and then they will end the marriage or get them through counseling and encourage the marriage to go on. So this is a process. The husband, he doesn't want to be a part of the marriage. He's made it very clear. He actually hates the lady. But just so that it increases her in suffering, he refuses to give the divorce. What does Allah say regarding this? وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ نَفْسَهُ Whoever does this to his wife, in reality has oppressed himself. وَلَا تَتَّخِذُوا آيَاتِ اللَّهِ huzua, And don't make a joke out of this religion. Allah is watching you, you are accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when a person gives his wife divorce, she goes into a waiting period. Regarding the waiting period, the husband has the right to now take her back into the marriage. If he thinks that the marriage can be, uh, if it, it can be salvaged, it can be saved. Allah says in the Qur'an, وَبُعُولَتُهُنَّ أَحَقُّ بِرَدِّهِنَّ uh, in aradu islaha. If both parties think that we can reconciliate and fix the problem, then there is permission for them to revoke the divorce and continue the marriage. Now, this is the scenario. This was commonly practiced uh, prior to Islam, and unfortunately, some people, even in Islam, Muslims practice this. What do they do? He gives his wife divorce. How many divorces can a husband give to his wife? In Islam, it was three. It is three. Before Islam, وَيَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ أَبَدًا بِغَيْرِ نِهَايَةً People will do this unlimited, because in pre-Islamic days, they weren't limited to three divorces. A husband can divorce his wife a hundred times if he wanted to. If he revoked within the waiting period, guess what? She's back in the boat. 
she's back in the marriage again. So what they would do, and what some Muslims do unfortunately, they divorce their wife, they make her sit in the waiting period for 89 days. How many days is the Idda supposed to be? According to our rough calculation, 90. On the 89th day, he comes and says, I take you back into my marriage. Are you understanding? And then what does he do two days after? He divorces her again, makes her sit in the waiting period for 89 days again. And then what does he do? I divorce you again. And then after two days, what does he do? He divorces her a third time. And this time he makes her sit in the whole 90 days. So the waiting period that should have been how long? Three months. Ends up becoming what? A whole pregnancy. It becomes a whole nine months. This is, what the, this is, the, this is an example of dharar in idda, Where a person is causing dharar. If a person does this sort of thing, what happens? So first of all, it's very clear. Based on this hadith, is this permissible to do? Yes or no? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is haram. This is not permissible for you to do. You will find la varar wa la virar happen in marriage so much. In particular when things are falling apart. You know, husband and wife, they, they, they bully each other. They'll say it's permissible what they're doing. But in reality, what are they actually doing? They're just bullying each other. Husband and wife go through a divorce. The wife finishes off her waiting period. She has some kids because she had with the two kids from the marriage. And now she wants to get married again. The husband says, Islamically, if you get married again, I get custody over the children. So he's threatening her, so she doesn't get married. She says that if I get married, I'm going to lose my kids. Now this, I don't want to use the language, but you guys can fill in language. This person, he has no capability to take care of kids. He has no interest in taking care of the kids. He knows the kids drive him crazy when they spend the weekend with him. Are you following this? But what is he threatening the wife? If you get married, what will I do? I'll take the kids. Is this Nikamma and San going to take the kids? He's not going to take the kids. He won't last with the kids. But the wife is so terrified for her kids that she says that if I get married, this person will take my kids away. You know what? I'm just going to stay without marriage. And he forces her in that manner. To, 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 he terrifies her, scares her, scare tactics. Again, لا ضرر ولا ذرار Absolutely haram and impermissible. Coming back to the first example. If a person does this to his wife where he makes her wait out the idda, and right before the, right before the idda ends, he revokes it. And then it makes her wait out the waiting period, and right before it ends, he revokes it. What's the ruling on such an action? وَذَهَبَ مَالِكٌ إِلَىٰ أَنَّ مَنْ رَاجَعَ إِمْرَأَتَهُ قَبْلَ إِنْقِضَاءِ عِدَّتِهَا ثُمَّ تَلَّقَهَا مِنْ غَيْرِ مَسِيسٍ أَنَّهُ إِنْ قَصَدَ بِذَلِكَ مُضَارَّتَهَا بِتَطْوِيرِ الْعِدَّةِ لَمْ تَسْتَأْنِفِ الْعِدَّةِ Yes, yeah, so it's a funny when Imam Malik pulls off. Such a beautiful ruling. Imam Malik says that if a person um, divorces his wife, those 85 days pass by. You know that 90 day example? 80 die, 85 days pass by. 85 days later, he revokes the divorce, and now he divorces her again. So Imam Malik says, she won't have to start 90 all over again. What will she do? She will continue from 85. And how many days will she have to sit in Idda? Five more days, her Idda ends, the marriage is done, she can go get married. However, in order for this to happen, Imam Malik puts two conditions, two very important conditions. What are the two conditions? The first one is, ثُمَّ طَلَّقَهَا مِنْ غَيْرِ مَسِيسٍ He didn't touch her, meaning they didn't have any sexual intimacy during those five days, or during those two, three days. Because if he revoked it and then they were sexually intimate, the idda will be needed. You will need to do it all over again, to make sure there is baraatu rahim, that there is no pregnancy involved. Okay? And the second thing he says, إِنْ قَصَدَ بِذَلِكَ مُضَارَّتَهَا That he intends to harm her. But if he doesn't intend to harm her, if he has no intention like that, وَإِلَّمْ يَخْصُدْ بِذَلِكَ إِسْتَأْنَفَتْ عِدَّةً جَدِيدَةً That if, she, if he had no intention to harm her, then she will need to, if it was just natural, that's what happened. He thought that he could make it work. They tried. Two days later they realized it wasn't going to work. He divorced her again. The technical Islamic ruling will be what? Because he issued a new divorce, what will happen to the idda? It will be reissued and it will start all over again. وَقِيلَ تَبْنِي مُطْلَقًا وَهُوَ قَوْلُ عَطَاءَ وَقَتَادَ وَالشَّافِعِ فِي الْقَدِيمِ وَأَحْمَدْ فِي رِوَايَةٍ Imam Ahmad, Imam Shafi'i, Qatada and Ata, they all say, 
regardless of his intention, she will start from 85 and move forward. What do they say? Tabani. What does Tabani mean? She will continue on from where she left off. She will continue on from where she left off. Regardless of his intention. Obviously, if they had intimacy, then she will have to start again. I'm making that very clear. So you don't misunderstand the fifth ruling here. This is about the intent of this person. وَقِيلَ تَسْتَأْنِفُ مُطْلَقًا وَهُوَ قَوْلُ الْأَكْثَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ أَبُوْ قِلَابَ وَالزُّهْرِ وَالثَّوْرِ وَأَبُوْ حَنِيفَ وَالشَّافِعِي فِي الْجَدِيدِ وَأَحْمَدْ فِي رِوَايَةٍ وَإِسْحَاقُ وَأَبُوْ عُبَيْدْ وَغَيْرُهُمْ And majority of the scholars, they say that she will need to start again because if there's a new divorce issued, what will happen? She will need to start the idda again. However, what this person is doing is absolutely wrong. And the lady can actually take her case to the qadi and the qadi can give a, a ruling uh, to, to minimize the difficulty on her. Now there are some examples of dharar. I'm going to give one or two examples of dharar where a person causes harm to another person without the intention of causing harm. They're just doing what they need to do. And coincidentally, what happens to the next person? They're getting hurt. I'm driving a car that's cheap to drive. The planet's dying, I don't care. Are you guys following? Is this person driving this car because he wants the planet to die? That's not why he bought the car. Why did he buy the car? Why did he buy this particular fridge? Why did he choose this particular source of energy? Not to break the, fam- not to break the planet, but because he wants to benefit himself. And in, the, in hindsight, while benefiting himself, what is he doing to the climate and the rest of the world? He's, he's destroying it. So this is another example of la varar wa la virar. Harm is being caused. What's the knee-jerk reaction in sharia to harm, guys? Remove it. We have to remove it instantly. So, what's an example of a person who causes harm to another individual without uh, intention, without the intention of harming them? Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, he gives, he gives a beautiful example. He says, فَمِن صُوَرِ ذَلِكَ And an example of this would be that a person has a house. Okay? He decides to add, أَوْ يَبْنِي بِنَاءً عَالِيًا يُشْرِفُ عَلَىٰ جَارِهِ وَلَا يَسْتُرُهُ That a person has a house, he adds a second floor to his house. He has a home. What does he add to his house? A second floor. Now his neighbor doesn't have a roof. People have those sort of houses. You know, some people, they have houses where they don't have a roof in there. Maybe they might have like a few, you know, something, some kind of streamers or something, but there's no, there's no roof. So he doesn't have a roof, not a proper roof. Now he comes to the Qadi and says, that this guy built a second floor, I don't have any privacy. Are you following? Yes or no? I lost my privacy. The Qadi is going to ask this guy, why did you build a second floor? He said, well, I built a second floor because I need it. La varar wa la virar. There was no intention here. I have no intention of harming this guy. I have no interest in looking in this guy's house. I just need a second floor in my house. This guy complains. He says, but because he built a second floor, I can't get the wind in my house anymore. I'm not getting proper sunlight, proper moonlight inside my house. وَكَذَلِكَ الْقَوْلُ فِي إِطَارَةِ الْبَنَّاءِ وَمَنَعِ الشَّمْسِ وَالْقَمَرِ That this person built a tall home, and because of that, I don't get you know, light inside my house. So what will happen here? Now the principle is here. لَا ضَرَرْ وَلَا ذِرَرْ No harm should be caused. Obviously by building a second floor, he's not harming himself. He's reciprocating harm. He's causing harm to another person. So now what will this person do? The fuqaha have differed in opinion. Again, this is not a fiqhi class, otherwise I would dissect the issue. It's a very interesting issue. But what I will say is that the, ans- the summary of the answer is this. Minimize the harm to this person. And the second thing, so there's three things. Minimize the harm to this person. Ensure that there is no intent of harming this person. And the third thing, allow what is socially acceptable. You guys understand? What are the three things? Minimize the harm. What does that mean, minimize the harm? The Qadi can tell the person who built the second floor that you are now responsible of financing the roof for this guy. By putting a, har- a roof on this guy's house and building your second floor, now is there any harm? Yes or no? No more harm. Or the Qadi can say, if you don't want to build a second, if you don't want to put a roof on this guy's house, then what you need to do is make sure the wall that's facing his house has no windows. What's another thing he can say? Make sure the wall that's facing his house has no windows. So step number one was what? Minimize the harm. Minimize the harm. Step number two, ensure that it wasn't done with the wrong intent. The person who built the second floor, make sure he wasn't doing it to hurt his neighbor. If he's doing it to hurt his neighbor, 
no building plan, no, no building permission, don't give it. If he's doing it because he genuinely needs it and he's not trying to hurt someone, then give him permission. The third thing, allow him to do that which is socially acceptable. So in this community, do people have two floor homes? That's the question. No one has it. This is the only guy who has it. Let's not do it. Everyone has a second floor. Everyone has a second floor. This guy wants a second floor. He needs a second floor. He's willing to mitigate the harm and cut it down and bring minimal harm to this person. Therefore, the Qadi will give permission that he can build a second floor. Are you guys following? Are you getting an appreciation for fiqh now? Yes? How these usul, these simple principles. La dharar wa la dhira. What a beautiful hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, so many examples of this. There are uh, an example of digging a well next to your neighbor's well. You suck the water from there. You know? La dharar wa la dhira. You tap into your neighbor's Wi-Fi. La dharar wa These are all the examples of people harming each other. In the, back home, uh, people, they tap into their neighbor's electricity. Are you guys aware of this? It's a common practice. Astaghfirullah <laughs> Rather than paying their own electricity bill, they'll tap into the next door neighbor's electricity wire um, and, 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 they'll, and they'll leech off there. When that neighbor finds out, things get really bad usually. They actually end very bad. But until they don't find out, free electricity. Then the Prophet ﷺ, in relation to this la dharar wa la dirar, he teaches us a very beautiful principle. Sometimes dharar is done by doing something, sometimes dharar is caused by preventing something. Fahimtum? You guys understand? Sometimes dharar is done, harm is caused by doing something, like building that second floor. I had to build the second floor to cause harm. Are you following? Sometimes dharar is done by withholding something. For example, there is only one body of water in the whole village, and that body of water happens to be surrounded by my land. Are you following? There's only one body of water in the whole village, and it happens to be surrounded by my land. Now this is the second example, because I'm not doing something to harm anyone. It's not like I did something to harm people. I'm just telling people nobody can step foot on my land. So I'm preventing. And by preventing, what's happening now? By preventing, what's happening? People don't have water. What are they going to do? So, la dharar wa la dhira. Again, you need to give access to the water. The Prophet ﷺ said, three things are such that people should not be prevented access from. Three things are such that people should not be prevented access from these three things. What are these three things? Al-nasu shuraka'u fi thalathin al-ma'u wa nar wa al-kala. Water, fire, and kala is... Uh, what do they call it? Um, in Urdu, we call it chara. What animals graze off of. It's right at the tip of my tongue. Fodder. Fodder. They call it fodder, right? Fodder. So, you know, what animals eat, the grass that animals eat, fodder. So, you shouldn't, stop, you shouldn't stop anyone from water, fire, or fodder. So, what that means is that there's water there. People want to come drink it, let them come and drink it. You, sh- you can't charge someone to drink from water. The only time you can charge someone to drink from water is if you put money into preserving that water. You understand? You put money into bottling the water. You put money into cleaning the water. You put your own money into digging the well. Now I can charge people. But if the water is naturally there, it's just natural, there's a pond that's naturally came into existence, can I charge animals from drinking from there? You can't charge animals. Can I charge human beings who drink from there? I can't charge them. Because I didn't do anything there. The water just came. Allah gave it to me. It happens to be in my land. So again, لا ضرر ولا ذرار. Regarding nar, regarding the fire, the scholars they say, وَأَمَّا النَّهِيُ عَنْ مَنْ النَّارِ فَحَمَلَهُ طَائِفَةٌ مِنَ الْفُقَهَاءِ عَلَى النَّهِي عَنَ الْإِقْتِبَاسِ مِنْهَا. What that means is that I have a fire. I've lit up a fire. I'm traveling. I, I was the one. I got some of the you know uh, the, whatever um, bark I needed to and the birch I needed to put the, build the fire. I built it. Now everyone else that comes, they're trying to build fires, but all the things that were needed to actually ignite the fire, I used them all up. Are you following the example? Everything that was needed to ignite a fire, I used it all up. Everyone else has wood, but they only have one log, one log, one log. I used 10 logs. I got there first, I used, I built, I used 10 logs. There are three other parties, everyone else has one log. You shouldn't stop them from fire. The scholars, they say what this means is, you don't have to allow them to take your 10 logs. You don't have to allow them to do that. However, you shouldn't stop them from bringing their own log, taking from your log and walking away. Taking from your fire. 
Because by igniting their fire through your fire, are you being harmed in any way at all? If you let someone come and ignite their fire from yours, are you being harmed in any way? Absolutely not. So these are all the examples of barar. Similarly, when it comes to pay, uh, payments, paying back a debt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَإِن كَانَ ذُو عُسْرَةٍ فَنَذِرَةٌ إِلَى مَيْسَرَةٍ Someone owes you money. You know, you know that they're in a difficult time. La ضَرَرْ وَلَا ذِرَارٍ You shouldn't cause harm to them when demanding the debt. What that means is, that the jamhur ulama, the majority of scholars they say, what this ayah is saying is that, someone owes you $10,000. They're having a rough patch in life. Financially really struggling. You want your money back. You go to that person and you say, give me my money. That person says, I don't have any money to give. All I have are, from, what's my basic, from what are amongst my basic necessity, I have some clothes, some basic food. What this person does is that, you know how you have these um, debt collectors? What are they called? No, in, in, um, there's a more harsher word. Um, uh, what do you call it? Loan sharks. Loan sharks. They don't just collect debts, what do they do? If you don't pay, what happens? They give you a piece of them. They beat you down. They'll take your stuff. They'll, they'll, they'll take everything from your house. So what ends up happening is that, وَلَا يُكَلَّفُ الْمَدِينُ أَنْ يَقْضِيَ مِمَّا عَلَيْهِ فِي خُرُوجِهِ مِنْ مِلْكِهِ ضَرَرٌ كَثْيَابِهِ وَمَسْكَنِهِ الْمُحْتَاجِ إِلَيْهِ That you take away his basic necessities to pay back his debt. You take away his clothes so that you can pay your debt off. You take away his house. You've taken his clothes away. You've taken his food away. You've taken his house away to pay back your debt. You got your money back, but did you harm someone on the way? We're not talking about taking away his luxury. He has a Ferrari sitting there. Reclaim it and get your money out of there. We're talking about what? You're taking away his basic base necessities, things that he lives by, things that he needs. So in closing, like I mentioned, this is a fiqhi maxim. And the thing with fiqhi usul is that the nature of usul is that they can be repeated in a hundred examples or a thousand examples because they're principles, you know. And there are books written on these principles. Uh, the Shafi'is have the famous Al-Ashbah wa Nadhair by Imam Suyuti. The Hanafis have a very famous Al-Ashbah wa Nadhair by Ibn Nujayim al-Misri. This is a book that we studied as students during our Tahasus fil fiqh program when we specialize in Islamic law, did the ifta program. They taught us Ibn Nujayim al Misri's Al Ashbah wa Nadair. And what they usually do in these books is that they'll establish a principle and they'll give you examples of how rulings are derived from these principles. So, as a student of Islamic law, you learn how to derive rulings. For the average person, for the person who's just trying to get, get through the day, these ahadith let them humble you. Let, you, let yourself learn to appreciate what the fuqaha go through and what kind of processes they have in place before they derive legal rulings. How deep our deen is, how robust it is. The usul in the deen are what keep the entire deen together. If you wish to be a student of Islamic law, you must become acquainted with the usul of the deen. You must become acquainted with the laws of the deen. There are some laws that relate to tazkiyah, spirituality. There are some laws that relate to fiqh, legality. There are some laws that relate to mu'ashara, human to human interaction. The, once you learn the principles, the issues are copy, are copy and paste. Because the issues will keep changing. You just have to know what the principles are, what the rulings are. From this hadith, there's three, one or two basic points. The first thing is, our deen teaches us, just because it's halal doesn't mean you can do it. And many of the examples I gave above, if you wrote it on a wall and asked, is it halal? What would the answer be? Technically, many of these things were halal. The guy was watering trees that were in his land. Yes, sir, remember that example? He was watering trees that were in his land. Is that halal? Sure. This hadith is teaching us just because it's halal doesn't mean you should do it. If you're harming someone knowingly, Allah will punish you on the Day of Judgment for this. If you're harming someone unknowingly, the second you are informed that you're harming someone, find a solution. Find a solution. And I gave you the, diff the different methods the scholars use to create these um, solutions. Al-akhdu bil adab al-aliya wal akhlaq al-fadila. That as insan, as human beings, we should always have good character. We should never want to harm anyone. And when we say harm anyone, maybe this entire lecture you've been thinking, I'm only speaking about um, humans. The fuqaha under this hadith speak very clearly. They say it refers to ashjar, haywan, the ard, the everything. They say that don't cause harm to animals, to trees, 
to water. Don't cause harm to anything or anyone. Harm should not exist in the equation of the life of the believer. And if it does exist, it must be justifiable. When aqabtum fa'aqibu bi mithri ma'uqibtum bi. Someone harms you, you can seek retribution, but it has to be justifiable. Remember, illa bi dalilin, as I said earlier. It has you have to prove that this retribution is justified. And the qadi, the judge, has to give permission for it. It has to go through a process before any harm can be caused. Otherwise, by default, um, there is no harm in the deen. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us from those who stay away from harming others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us, preserves us, and makes us a people of justice, mercy, and forgiveness. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.